So uh, my, my intention this weekend in the two sessions we have is to cover the entire book of Esther. I'm not certain that we're going to be able to do that. I was wrestling with what to do about this. I, I've resolved in my mind what I need to do is I need to cover the part that I'm going to cover ex extensively so you really get a sense of what's going on even if we don't get through the whole thing. So we are going to try to move fairly quickly. I've put up on the board a list of places that we're going to go, so hopefully that will be of some help to you. Uh, let's go ahead and jump in. As you think about the book of Esther, the, the first thing that you need to consider, there's a very curious fact, and that is this. In the book of Esther, God is never mentioned. The word God never appears. The word Lord never appears. What some do with that is they get the idea that Esther shouldn't be in the canon. In other words, it can't really be one of the books the Holy Spirit wrote because the word God isn't there and the word Lord isn't there. Now, that's a silly idea. Esther should be in the canon. But it is a curious thing that the word God never appears and the word Lord never appears. If you read the book of Esther and you watch what unfolds, God's presence is unmistakable. And you'll see that as we go through the book. So think through this with me. God's presence is clearly there, and yet Scripture never uses the word God and never uses the word Lord. Why is that? And what, I, what I'll suggest to you is this. As you study the book of Esther, one of the things you have to keep in your mind is, is this. There's a lot going on in Esther that is not explicitly stated. In other words, there's things going on that Scripture doesn't specifically call out. And I'll try to prove that to you, and you can decide whether or not that's the case or not. So, Esther 1.1. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. I don't know if you're like me, I'm lazy. So I, I see things like that and my first reaction is, yeah, 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 it had to be the days of someone. <laughs> but you know what happens? If you spend a couple hours to figure out what it's telling you, it will give you a frame of reference that provides clarity. So when you look at Ahasuerus, here's what you, you learn. Ahasuerus is the king of the Media Persia Empire. Ahasuerus is the son of Cyrus. His son is Darius. So if you put him in a line, it's Cyrus, then Ahasuerus, which is the king in, in Esther, and then Darius. The word Ahasuerus means, and there's different, different lexicons define this differently. You should be skeptical of lexicons. You shouldn't believe anything I'm about to tell you. But what happens is when you see a name in the scripture, you are seeing a word that has been left untranslated. I don't think there's much benefit in going to the Greek or Hebrew to change what the King James text says, because I think that God got it right. And I think you second-guessing him is not productive. But a word like Ahasuerus is a word that has not been translated. So there is some benefit in trying to understand what the name means. According to Strong's, it means this. Now, there's other lexicons say different things, but I share this with you because it's interesting. Ahasuerus means, I will be silent and poor. Isn't that a strange name to give someone? I will be silent and poor. As we go through the book, think about whether that name is indicative of what Ahasuerus is like. So get with me Ezra 1. Ezra chapter 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, if you recall, Cyrus is Ahasuerus' father. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might, might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts, beside the freewill offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. So I want you to notice what we just learned. This is Ahasuerus' dad. 
Ahasuerus is the king of Media Persia, and what he says is, The Lord God charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem. And what he then does is he supports Israelites returning to the land and building the temple. Is this a wise king or a foolish king? This is a very wise king. If you're a Gentile ruler on the earth, should you bless Israel? You ought to because of Genesis 12.3, right? What God says in Genesis 12.3, Them that bless thee, I will bless. Them that curse thee, I will curse. So if you're a Gentile ruler on the earth, would it be wise for you during the prophetic times to bless Israel? It would be very wise. So I want you to notice Cyrus is a great king. He's the king of Media Persia, and he specifically supports the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. Now look with me at Ezra 4. Ezra chapter 4. So Israel begins to build the temple. Are there some people on the earth that aren't going to like that? Yes, there are. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity built the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Asser, which brought us up hither. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build an house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel as... King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. What a good king. What he's there doing is he's telling Israel, I instruct you to go build a temple in Israel to the Lord God. And what happens is as they do that, they face opposition because there are people that are striving politically to prevent them from doing that. Next verse. Verse 4, Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. You see what they did there? They said, what we need is we need some lobbyists, right? They hired some lobbyists and said, we need you guys to interfere with this building project that's going on. Now, notice what it then says. To frustrate their purpose, all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So here's a real tricky one. If it's Cyrus, Ahasuerus, Darius... That means this lobbying goes on throughout all of that time. And that lobbying is going on even during Ahasuerus' reign. So what happens is Ahasuerus' dad says to Israel, go build the temple. They're still working on it, and they're still getting opposition while Ahasuerus is king. That's the part I want you to to notice. All right, back to Esther 1. This is Ahasuerus, which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over 107 and 20 provinces. Do you know how vast a land space that is? Just think about the map. It goes from India all the way up through the Middle East down to Africa. So the the Media Persia Empire is enormous. Verse 2, that in those days when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan the palace, in the third year of his reign he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. When he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even an hundred and fourscore days. How many days is that? 180. Now, do you understand what's going on here? I want you to just get a picture of this empire. The empire ranges from India to Ethiopia, has 127 provinces. It is vast. He decides to have a feast to show the splendor of the kingdom. And how long does the feast last? 180 days. Think about the United States. The United States is a pretty significant country in, in the history of the world. When we have a presidential inauguration, it doesn't last a week, right? So this guy, when he throws a party, he throws a party. It lasts half a year. I mean, there are rock stars today that could not party 180 days straight. Right? They couldn't. they just kill him. Verse 5. And when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan the palace, both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. What he then does, he has a normal party, if you will, for the royals for 180 days. And then he says, let's have a party for seven days for the help. That's what he just did. 
I want you to get a picture in your mind of how grand this kingdom is. It's vast, it's wealthy, it's significant. Verse 6. Where were white, green, and blue hangings, fastened with cords of fine linen, and purple to silver rings, and pillars of marble. The beds were of gold and silver upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black and marble. And they gave them drink in vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another. What that's telling you right there, when they drink, you know, a lot of the parties I go to, the things I have, they have paper cups. Some of them are nice and they have plastic. Occasionally they have glass. I've never been in an event where the vessels are carved out of gold. Right? And then what did it just say? They were diverse one from another. He didn't get just normal golden ones. He's like, I want them to be individually crafted. The wealth of this kingdom is vast. And royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king. Verse 8. And the drinking was according to the law. What you're going to notice about the Media Persia Empire is they have a very strict focus on the rule of law, and they're going to follow it specifically. None did compel. For so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. What the king says in the kingdom is observed. Verse 9. Also Vashti the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. Now notice what's going on here. The king is holding this very significant party that lasts 180 days. And what does the queen do? The queen decides to hold a vent at exactly the same time. Now, is the king going to like this? The king's not going to like this. Keep reading. And Vashi the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house which belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded... The seven chamberlains, I'm not going to read their names, that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was fair to look on. So what the king does here is he wants to show off his wife, so he sends for Vashti to come. Verse 11. Then the king, uh, verse 12, I'm sorry. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. He wants to show her off. She's like, I'm not coming. I got my own party. I'm not going. Verse 13. Then the king said to the wise men which knew the times, for so was the king's matter toward all that knew law and judgment. So the king solicits his counselors and says, what should I do about this? The queen has refused to attend. Verse 14. And the next unto him was Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Maris, Marcina, and Memekan, the seven princes of Persia and Media, which saw the king's face and which sat the first in the kingdom. Now I want you to notice one thing before we go on here. Chapter 1 lists the chief seven princes of Persia at that time. Who didn't it list? It didn't list Haman, did it? Now, we're going to meet, as we go on in Esther, we're going to meet someone called Haman that's going to be significant. What I want you just to notice at the start, he's not in chapter 1. He's not one of the the princes that's listed at that time. Verse 15. What shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to law? Because she hath not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains. So the king isn't hasty here. He says, we're going to operate according to the law. What should be done? Because the queen disobeyed. Verse 16, And Memekin answered before the king and the priests, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in the provinces of the king Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes. When it shall be reported, the king Ahasuerus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. What's going on there, there's a verse in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 8.11, which, just turn there briefly, Ecclesiastes 8.11. Ecclesiastes 8.11. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. I'll just mention this and you can evaluate this for what it's worth. One of the problems you have in any criminal justice system is when you do not carry out sentence against an evil work speedily, what happens? 
The hearts of men is fully set in them to do evil. What they conclude is, I can get away with it. Punishment won't happen. It, there's a great chance I'll get off. Even if they catch me, it'll take too long. What happens is, sentence against an evil work has to be executed speedily, or else the hearts of men is fully set in them to do evil. So the concern here, go back to Esther, the concern that they have is, look, the queen did this. If this gets abroad into the kingdom, it's going to lead to more and more problems. Verse 18. Esther 118, Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes which have heard of the deed of the queen, Thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. Verse 19, If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it be not altered. Let me say one thing before we go on here. One of the things you're going to notice in the book of Esther is the way that the laws of the Persians and the Medes work is once a law is written, it cannot be altered. Now, is that the way things work, for example, in the United States? Does Congress change its mind occasionally? Yes, they do. But that's not the way it worked in Media Persia. Once a law is written, once it's put in stone, it cannot be altered. And you're going to see how that's relevant in the book. Let it, uh, let it be written among the laws of the Persians and Medes, and Medes that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. Now notice something here, and the book of Esther is very much a book of contrast. But what has happened here is Vashti didn't want to come when the king summoned her, and now what's going to happen? She'll never see him again, right? So she refuses, and she's going to be essentially exiled. What's happened now is they're going to put into place a process to take her royal estate and give it to someone else. She's not going to be queen anymore. Verse 20. And when the king's decree, which he shall make, shall be published throughout all his empire, for it is great. All the wives shall give to their husbands honor, both to great and small. And the saying pleased the king and the princes. And the king did according to the word of Memucan. For he sent letters into all the king's provinces, into every province according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, that every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the language of every people. So the king signs a law that every man should bear rule in his house. And you notice what happens there is they have all these provinces. They have to take time to put it in writing, to distribute it to all of them. And they have to put it into all these different languages. Chapter 2. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what was decreed against her. Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, Let there be fair young virgins sought for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan the palace, to the house of the women, unto the custody of Hegi, the king's chamberlain, keeper of the women, and let their things for purification be given them. And let the maiden which pleaseth the king be queen instead of Vashti. And the thing pleased the king, and he did so. So what are they holding there? They're holding a beauty pageant. Isn't that what they're doing? So what they do is they send word throughout the kingdom, everyone in your provinces, what you do, whoever's the the leader of that province that that reports up to Ahasuerus, scope out the fair young virgins in your locale and then send send the choice ones to the king. I mean, I think that's that's what it's saying. That's essentially they're having a beauty pageant there is what they're doing. Verse 5, we'll say more about that in a minute. Now in Shushan the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Now from that sentence, from that verse, what jumps into your mind? So one of the things we know about this gentleman is... When you trace back his lineage, Mordecai, it goes to the son of Kish. Is there anyone else you know who's a son of Kish? Get 1 Samuel. 
One of the things I mentioned earlier is sometimes when we see things like that where it's name after name after name, the first thing that goes through our mind is, okay, I'm going to tune this out, right? This sounds like a genealogy, and I don't want to mess with this. This seems boring and tedious and all that. And I'm as guilty of that as anyone. What happens when you tune that stuff out is you're tuning out something that God wants you to know. Look at me at 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abael, the son of Zeror, the son of Betcherath, the son of Aphiah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul. So the father of Saul is Kish. What we just saw, Mordecai is the son of, a couple removed, he's the son of Kish. So one of the things that's going on, Mordecai, who's going to be one of our protagonists in the book of Esther, he is a grand nephew of King Saul. Just keep that in your mind. You're going to see how that's, that's relevant. Look with me at Ezra 2. Ezra chapter 2. Verse 1. Now these are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity, of those which have been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon had carried away unto Babylon, and came again unto Jerusalem and Judah, every one to his city, which came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Rela. What's the next one? Mordecai. What Mordecai is, if you think of when Judah is conquered, Mordecai is one of those that is carried away into captivity, but he also returns again to Jerusalem. Go back with me to Esther. Verse 5. This is describing Mordecai again. Let's look at verse 6. Who had been carried away from Jerusalem... With the captivity which had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter. So notice something here. Esther is his uncle's daughter. So what relation is that to Mordecai? A cousin. I just tell you that for the following reason. Sometimes when you hear people talk about the book of Esther, what they'll typically say is that Esther is Mordecai's niece. And it's true that Mordecai is older than Esther, but he's not her uncle. He's actually her cousin. Uh, my, my point is, I just want you to know, one of the things you have to do in your Bible study is if your mind is anything like mine, it's filled with all sorts of nonsense that men say that is completely unscriptural. And what happens is we have these things in our frame of reference that honestly would be better if we had amnesia, right? And we just forgot all those things because what happens is we approach the Bible with these false conceptions and we ought to just get them out of our minds. All right, so let's read more about Esther here. His uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So Mordecai does appear to be older than Esther. He takes her for his daughter. The, the name Hadassah, which is her, her Hebrew name, means myrtle. The name Esther means star. We're told from that verse she's fair and beautiful. So Esther is obviously quite, quite a, presents quite an appearance. Verse 8. So it came to pass... When the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan the palace, to the custody of Haggai, that Esther was brought also unto the king's house, to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him. And he speedily gave her her things for purification, with such things as belonged to her, and seven maidens which were meet to be given her out of the king's house. And he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women. So what happens with Esther is as the various lieutenants, if you will, in the kingdom are conducting this search, she's identified as someone that they're going to send to the palace. So she's sent there. When she's then put under the custody of the king's chamberlain, what happens? The king's chamberlain says, this one's my favorite. 
And so what he does is he gives her the best accommodations. That's what that verse is telling you. Verse 10. Notice this. Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. So what does Esther not disclose there? She doesn't tell them she's a Jew, right? The other thing that's interesting there, and you can study out and see what what you think this means, but it says actually two things there. It says, had not showed her people nor her kindred, nor her kin. Well, who did we just learn Esther's related to? She's related to King Saul, isn't she? Mordecai is the grandnephew of Saul, and this is his cousin. Right? If you think of Britain, Mordecai would be considered a royal, wouldn't he? He's the grandnephew of what, what used to be the king. And this right here is his cousin. My point is these, these are not, these are Israelites of some prominence. You need to be aware of that. And, of course, they've been carried away into captivity. So what happens here in, in chapter 2, verse 10, Mordecai is very shrewd. And what he says to Esther is, Esther, don't tell anyone that you're a Jew. And don't tell them anything about your background. This is going to become significant later. Verse 11. And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. Now when every maid's turn was come to go into King Ahasuerus, after that she had been twelve months according to the manner of the women, for so were the days of their purifications accomplished, to wit, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with sweet odors and with other things for the purifying of the women. So what happens is before they bring these women to the king, they purify them in some way for for a year. Verse 13. Then thus came every maiden unto the king. Whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the women unto the king's house. I think the idea of that is so the women are going to, to spend time with the king. They're allowed to take with them whatever thing, you know, ornament of jewelry, whatever they think will accentuate their beauty that, that they would like to Take with him. That's the idea, I believe. Verse 14. In the evening she went, and on the morrow she returned into the second house of the women, to the custody of Shasgaz, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubines. She came in unto the king so mo- no more, except the king delighted in her, and that she were called by name. Do you see what's going on here? What happens is they take all these women out of the provinces, they bring them to the palace, and what essentially they have, you know, they purify them for a year, then they have this one-night audition, and if the king doesn't delight in them, they're moved into the second house of the women, and that house of the women is called the house of what? The concubines. Are they legally married wives, or are they concubines? They're concubines. Think about this with me. Get Exodus, if you would. Get Exodus 21. Does the Old Testament law permit concubinage? And the answer is it does not. Look with me at Exodus 21. Does the Old Testament law permit a man to have more than one wife? It does. Exodus 21 verse 10. If he take him another wife, it's not saying it recommends it, but it permits it. If he take him another wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall he not diminish. What Exodus 21 says is that under the law, if you have a wife and you decide to take another, what you cannot do to the first wife is you can't diminish any of the support or companionship that you're obligated to provide. That's what Exodus 21 says. Now, there's a number of reasons for that, among which is to treat the woman justly and and equitably. Concubinage is is an institution that man creates in order to avoid what the woman's legal right is under the law. 
Now think for this, think just with me about this for a moment. So Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Is there any way that he didn't violate that verse? He had to violate that verse. Now my point is what happens is men, and so this is not news, this is the way it's always been, but men decide to circumvent God's law because they have things they want to do, and it's just how, how things work. But what I want you to get is what Ahasuerus is doing here, this system they've set up, I suggest to you, is a very cruel system. Because what it does is it takes all the, the young maidens that are attractive out of the provinces, send them to the king, and what's going to happen to 99.9% .9 of them? They're going to go through this process. They're going to end up in the house of the concubines. They're never going to see the king. So it's, it's, it's a cruel system. Um, man is cruel. That's what he does. Look at Esther 2, verse 15. Now, when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go in unto the king... She required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. So what Esther does is she goes in without any of the accoutrements. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. Verse 16. So Esther was taken unto King Ahasuerus into his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. Now if you recall from chapter 1. Vashti, when she refused to go see the king, that was in the third year of his reign. So the king is, apparently spends four years, or some amount of time, because it takes a while to set up this process, but he spends that time conducting this beauty pageant. I, I will tell you, you know, this is my own, take this for what it's worth, I'm exceedingly uncomfortable with beauty pageants, and I'm exceedingly uncomfortable with them, because it seems to me they're derived from something like this, uh, which is... Not something that, that's appropriate. That, that's my view in any event. Verse 17. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast unto all his princes and his servants, even Esther's feast. And he made a release to the provinces and gave gifts according to the state of the king. One of the things that's a, that's a fun thing to do as you read through the book of Esther, make a list of all the parallels and contrasts. So you see what happens here? What, what, what starts a whole series of events in motion is Vashti, the king wants her, wants his wife, to come to this feast that he's having, which is not an unreasonable request. And Vashti's like, no, I'm not going to do it. Esther here now gets a specifically appointed feast called Esther's Feast for her. So you just see the contrast there. Verse 19. I'm sorry, let me read 17, 18, then we'll get 19. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast unto all his princes and servants, even Esther's feast, and he made a release to the provinces and gave gifts according to the state of the king. Verse 19. And when the virgins were gathered the second time... Wait a minute. <laughs> the whole reason we went through this exercise the first time was to identify a queen. Right? Apparently the king says this is a good process. So we're going to do this again. You, you know, as you read Esther, reach whatever conclusion you want. I don't have a high opinion of Ahasuerus. Um, he seems to make a lot of very questionable decisions. But this is in any event what he's doing. Verse 19, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. Verse 20, Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her people, as Mordecai had charged him, charged her. For Esther did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him. Again, a contrast between Vashti and Esther. Vashti refuses instruction that she should take. What Esther does is she obeys exactly what Mordecai told her. And that's going to turn out to be significant. Now notice another thing. Here's what happens here. Esther now becomes the queen of the Persian Empire, this vast empire. And you know what she still does? Does she say to Mordecai, hey, Mordecai, look, I'm done with you. Know, I don't need your advice anymore, right? I can operate on my own. But she still respects him and she still obeys what he tells her. Verse 21. In those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Bigthan and Teresh, 
of those which kept the door were wroth, and sought to lay hand on the king Ahasuerus. And the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. So Mordecai tells Esther, Esther, there's this plot, here's the people, and Esther goes to the king, says, king, you need to know this, and by the way, Mordecai is the source of this information. Verse 23, and when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out, therefore they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. So what happens is there's a book of Chronicles that that catalog the significant events in the kingdom, and they write this down. Okay? Chapter 3, we're going to come now to a crisis, to a turning point in the book of Esther. After these things, and uh, the sense of that almost is how quickly things change. After these things, did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him? Now, I'll say this about myself, but it's true of many of us. When you read that verse, it should hit you like a lightning bolt. And it doesn't because we're biblically ignorant. Now, I'm going to suggest this to you as we go through the book of Esther and get to the end of it. At times, you know what we think? At times we think the Bible has hard verses to understand, like First, uh, first, Chronicle, first uh, Corinthians 15, baptism for the dead. What's that? I mean, who knows what that is? And sometimes we think of verses like that, and we think the Bible has tough verses. Can I tell you something? The problem is not that we don't understand the tough verses. I think the problem is we don't even understand whole books. I think there are things we think we understand that we have no idea about. And, and some of the things I'm going to share with you in Esther, uh, for years, I, you know, I'd read Esther a long time ago, and I was aware of it. I thought it was a nice story and so on. And as I, something piqued my attention and brought me to look at these things, and I realized I had no idea what was going on. And I think that, you know, personally, I just think that's very common, that we just actually have no idea because we are so biblically ignorant. So why should that verse hit you like a ton of bricks? Well, notice what it says. Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite. And we're going to talk about what that means. Before we do that, let me just make a couple other points on on, on this verse. It says, after these things. So what happens is, Some time passes and something changes. I wonder, think about this, if what happens here with Haman is a good picture of what happens with the beast, or what's commonly called the Antichrist. In other words, what happens is he seems to come out of power out of nowhere. If you remember in verse 1, or chapter 1, when we looked at the chief princes in Media Persia, Haman's not even mentioned. He's not even identified there. When you get to verse 1, what happens is he's gone from somewhere low. He's now above all the princes in the kingdom. His rise to power has been profound and quick. The word Haman means magnificent. Hamadatha, that's his father, it means double. This is a man, as we're going to see, this is a man of some significant means. All right, let's talk about Agagite. Get with me Exodus 17. Exodus 17. We're going to spend a little bit of time now, and you just need to understand who the Amalekites are. Exodus 17, verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. That's Exodus 17, 8. Look at verse 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book. And rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. God has a grievance with Amalek, does he not? Verse 16, for he said, because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Get Deuteronomy 25. Amalek does something that irritates God so greatly that God swears by himself. In other words, if God said he's going to do something, he's going to do it. When he swears, what he's, he's emphasizing the fact, my mind is made up that I'm going to do something. And he swears that he's going to war with Amalek. Deuteronomy 25, verse 17. Now notice what's happening here in Deuteronomy 25, 17. 
This is going to give us some additional clarity on what happened in Exodus 17. One of the things that's a mistake, sometimes we read a book and we think we can get a sense of what's going on from simply reading the book. But what the Bible does all the time is it contains information about what happened in that book elsewhere. And if you don't run the cross-references, you won't get a full picture of what's happening. Deuteronomy 25, verse 17. Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way when ye were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou wast faint and weary, and he feared not God. Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under for heaven Thou shalt not forget it. You see what's going on there? So let's, let's make sure we get this picture. When Israel is leaving Egypt, when they're leaving Egypt, should any sane person on the earth have a question as to who God's people is? I mean, if you think about it, just think with me for a moment. The reason Israel leaves Egypt is Pharaoh keeps refusing to let him go, and God keeps creating more and more curses. Finally, he does the curse of the firstborn, which kills Pharaoh's child, among other thousands of Egyptians. And Pharaoh says, look, I don't want to let these guys go, but you've got to go because I can't take it anymore. Right? My kingdom is in shambles. Not only have you killed my son, but you've killed the livestock, and there's lice everywhere, and the water's turned to blood. And and I don't like Jehovah, but you just got to go because I can't take it anymore. That's really what's happening. So he lets Israel go, but what happens? He lets them go and says, I shouldn't have done that. Just an act of stupidity, right? So he says, I'm going to go get them. I change my mind. The Red Sea parts. If you didn't know they were God's people before, and you follow them, and the God parts the sea so they can walk through on dry land, is that like a clue? He's like, they're getting away. Run in and get them. So they do that. What happens? Now his army's destroyed. So like Pharaoh is making bad decision after bad decision. You know what the Amalekites do? The Amalekites are worse than Pharaoh. Because what happens is, think of Israel leaving Egypt. There's millions of people. And what the Amalekites do is they wait. So think of Israel leaving in this massive convoy. They're not walking in a line three million wide. There's some space to it. You know the ones that are at the end of it? The ones that that chapter says are feeble and weak, that are struggling. So what Amalek does is saying, look, I can't take on the guys at the front. I can't take on the whole group. Let me hide, and I'll kill the stragglers. That's what's happening in that verse. And God detests it so much. What he says, when you're in the land and you have peace from your enemies and you've conquered them, you know what you're going to do? You're going to blot them out from under heaven. Now, here's what happens. Man looks at the Bible and says, well, like God, he is a mean God. He is a nasty, nasty God, and he's a racist, and he's in favor of genocide. He's just a really bad God. And what man does is man approaches the Bible from the perspective of, well, God doesn't meet our sensibilities, right? He's just a bad God. Well, can I suggest to you that everything God does in the Scripture, he has more than adequate reason, right? Right? He does. He absolutely does. So when he has sworn to destroy a Malik, he has a valid reason. Okay? That's what that's the backstory. You need to know that. Now get with me first Samuel fifteen. And, and what I would just say is as we're turning there, you realize when Amalek is doing that, it is the most intentional rebellion against God because it's absolutely clear that it's God's people. That's being proven conclusively at that point. First Samuel fifteen, verse one. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel. Did God forget? No, he he has a good memory. How he laid wait for him in the way when he came up out of Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy Israel. All that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. So King Saul there is instructed to go destroy Amalek. Verse 8. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. 
Is that what he was supposed to do? And the answer is no, it's not. Look at verse 11. Starting verse 10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. Now you realize what happens here. At the very beginning of Saul's reign is when God gets annoyed with Saul. And the reason why is God tells Saul, Hey Saul, as the king, I want you to go do what I have sworn for hundreds of years that I want accomplished. Go and kill them all. And Saul says, Well, I'll kill some of them, but I'm going to keep the king. I'm going to do this, and I've got a better plan. And God decides at that point, I I regret having made you king. Verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. So at this point in Saul's reign, early on, he's rejected as king. Verse 32. Then said Samuel, Bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. Aha. So what we have here, Agag is the king of the Amalekites. Haman was what? An Agagite. That tells you Haman is two things. He's not only an Amalekite that God once utterly destroyed, but he's a descendant of the king of the Amalekites. Isn't that what it means? That's what it means. Verse 33. Uh, Read verse 32 again. Then said Samuel, Bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him delicately. And Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. What does Samuel say about that? And Samuel said, As thy sword hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. So notice what happens here. Saul spares Agag... But Samuel doesn't. But apparently what happened prior to this, Agag had had descendants, hadn't he? And those descendants were ultimately going to include Haman. So think about this with me. Now what I'm going to suggest to you here, the book of Esther never explicitly says this, okay? But let me suggest to you this is what's going on and decide in your conscience and by the word of God whether it's right or not. Do you think Mordecai knows about Exodus and 1 Samuel? I mean, Mordecai is a shrewd guy. So does Mordecai know that God wanted Amalek destroyed? It seems to me he knew that. Does Mordecai, as the grand nephew of Saul, does he know about this occurrence in 1 Samuel 15? Yeah, he does. So let me suggest this to you. Mordecai and Esther are descendants of King Saul. They're relatives of him, are they not? Haman is an Agagite. He's a descendant of Agag. And Saul was God's instrument of vengeance. Now, even though Saul rebelled against what God wanted him to do, did Saul nonetheless kill a whole bunch of Amalekites in that chapter? And he did. So what I'll suggest to you, and you can believe this, not believe this, but just as when you read the book of Esther and you never see God's name even though his presence is unmistakable. Can I suggest to you that part of what's going on in the book of Esther is it's not just a tension that between Haman and Mordecai where Haman gets upset because Mordecai won't bow to him. I, I, I suggest to you that it's, it's deeper than that. I suggest to you that what's going on there is Haman has an understanding that he is an Amalekite and he has an understanding that Israel has destroyed Amalekites. And Mordecai has an understanding of exactly who that is. Okay? Now you can decide whether or not you think that's true. Um, I'll suggest you consider it. So look with me then at Esther chapter 3 verse 2. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. So think for a moment about what's happened just for a minute. Ahasuerus' father is King Cyrus. King Cyrus is a great king. What King Cyrus commands is he commands the Israelites, go back to Jerusalem and build a temple. That's a great thing. You go one generation later, and Ahasuerus, uh, Cyrus' son Ahasuerus, you know what he does? 
He takes an Amalekite and makes the Amalekite the number two in the kingdom. Do you see how quickly the Persian Empire is deteriorating? It's gone from a king that is trying to bless Israel to a king that says, let me take an Amalekite whom God wants to destroy and blot out, and I'm going to put him in charge of the kingdom. Do you see how quickly things have changed? They have. Let's talk about bowing down just for a minute. If you look at... um, I'm not going to spend the time to do this. If you read through the Old Testament, there are numerous instances of someone bowing to another and there being nothing wrong with it. Ruth bows to Boaz, for example. As far as I can tell, there is nothing in the Old Testament scriptures that prevents bowing as a, as a appropriate respect of authority, assuming it's proper. And the reason I mention that is, what's, what's going on in this verse? So in other words, the Old Testament doesn't specifically prohibit bowing. There are people in the Old Testament that bow and nothing bad is said about it. But the Old Testament does, look with me at Exodus 20. It does forbid something. Exodus 20. Verse 3. Exodus 20, verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God. There are multiple verses in the Old Testament that forbid Israel to bow down to a false god, even though there are times where they bow down to someone as a respect of of authority. Get with me, Daniel 3. Daniel chapter 3, verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Now, I want you to notice something similar here. What happens here in Daniel with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is the enemies of Israel are trying to find a way to trick, to capture Israel by the force of secular law. So what they do is they create a secular law that says, hey, if you're a citizen of the kingdom, what you need to do is when you hear the music, you need to bow down to these gods. And what they've done is they've created a man's law that violates the Old Testament law because Exodus said they couldn't bow down to a false god. And what they're trying to do, this happens with Israel a number of times, is what their enemies do is they create a a man's law that's directly contrary to God's law so that a believing Israelite can't obey it. And as soon as they violate that man's law, then they're going to punish him. And that's, that's something very similar to what Haman has done here. Look at verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. What happens there is they say, look, Our God can deliver us, and we're not going to bow down to your false image. And we think God will deliver us. But, you know, even if he doesn't, we're still not bowing down. We'll just accept the consequences as they are. Look with me at Daniel 6. Daniel 6, verse 3. 
Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. That's exactly what the enemies of Israel do. So let me suggest this to you. The Old Testament does not forbid bowing as an act of courtesy when it's appropriate. So why does Mordecai refuse to bow down to Haman? And I'll give you two answers, and you can consider if they're valid or if there's something else. The first is, Israel is forbidden to bow down to a false god. And what Haman has done is he has set himself up as a god in Media Persia. And I'll show you why I think that's true. The second reason that Mordecai may, not, may refuse to bow down to him is, Mordecai understands that's an Amalekite. That's someone that God wants to utterly blot out, and I'm not going to bow down to him. Okay? So maybe both of those, uh, maybe neither of those, it's, you, know, you can decide what you will. But it seems to me that's what's going on. It's, it's not simply that Mordecai says, well, I can't bow to another man. That, that's, that's not it. Go back to Esther chapter 3, verse 3. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass, when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. So this is interesting. If you recall, he specifically told Esther not to reveal her people or her kindred. But Mordecai does reveal here his. And, and I, I think what perhaps what he's doing there is he's revealing the reason why he can't do this. Mordecai is not refusing to obey the king's law just simply to be a troublemaker. He, he feels a conviction that he can't obey it is the idea. Verse 5. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. Well, that's a sober and temperate reaction, right? So someone doesn't bow to you, and so what you decide is, hmm... Should I kill him? No, that doesn't seem adequate. Why don't I kill everyone related to him throughout the Persian Empire? That seems reasonable. Right? Haman is so self-absorbed, someone doesn't bow to him, and his immediate conclusion is to commit ethnic cleansing. I mean, that, that's what's happening there. Now, by the way, let me suggest this to you. It seems to me all other Old Testament observing Jews should have the same response Mordecai did. This is not personal to him. Others should have the same instance. They may simply not be in Shushan, the palace, or they, they, they just may not be doing what they should. Now, so think through this with me for just a moment. Haman, according to that verse, now knows that Mordecai is a Jew, doesn't he? Now, Haman is, is, is magnificent. He, he has massive wealth, as we'll see here. I, I, I'm just going to say, to you, it's incomprehensible to me that Haman doesn't know his own history. In other words, do, 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 do each of us know things about our family history? I mean, we do, right? You could spend hours sharing all the quirky tidbits about your family history. It's hard for me to imagine Haman is not aware of the fact, one, that he's an Amalekite, two, that he's an Agagite, and three, that, oh, by the way, a couple generations back, Israel tried to wipe out the entire family. Is that sort of information that would get passed down? It is. So it seems to me he would know that. And he may well know that Mordecai is a relative of Saul. Wouldn't that be interesting? Wouldn't that make the feud even a little bit more personal? Hey, this is one of the relatives. You can't kill Saul at this point because Saul's already gone. But can you kill his descendants? Yeah, you could. Uh, my point is there's no verse in Esther that says Haman knows that. 
But there's also no verse in Esther that says God's involved in Esther. There's a lot going on in Esther that is not explicitly called out. And what I'll just suggest to you is, is the real story of what's going on is deeper. And the players involved have an understanding of, of who the others are and, and what they're trying to accomplish. All right, so look with me at uh, verse 7. In the first month, that is the month Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast Pur, that is the lot, before Haman from day to day and from month to month to the twelfth month, that is the month Adar. Notice what's going on here. They cast Pur, that is the lot. So what does it mean to cast lots? Here's what it means to cast lots. Maybe you've done this. Have you ever had a decision and you're trying to decide what to do and you take out a die and you roll it? Now, it's not exactly a scientific method to decide things now, is it? But what they would do in the Old Testament, would they cast lots to make decisions? They would. And in fact, in Israel, it was scripturally appropriate to do that in certain instances. They would cast lots to decide things. Now, the reason I mention that is notice the language of verse 7 very carefully. They cast per, that is the lot, and then what does it say? Before Haman, from day to day. If you look in your Bible, for every time there's a verse that says cast, lot, and before, every other time that that occurs, what does it say? They cast lots before the Lord. Every other time that occurs. And the idea is, what they're doing when they're they're casting lots before the Lord, is they're saying, Lord, I'm about to cast lots here, but I'm invoking your control to show me the results you want. You follow me? In other words, what they're doing is they're casting it before the Lord in His presence with the idea, God, you as the God can control this outcome, so you can show me what you want me to do. What Haman does here, I think is he setting himself up as a god. Because what happens is, instead of casting lots before the Lord, come into my presence, and you can cast lots before me. And that result will show you what to do. You follow me? What what Haman is doing here is he is setting himself up in media as if he is a god. Okay? Verse 8. And Haman said unto King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they the king's laws, therefore it is not for the king's profit to suffer them. Now we're going to see some things about King Ahasuerus here. The first thing to notice is here's what, uh, what Haman does. He says, King, there's some people throughout your kingdom, and their laws are different from yours, and they don't keep the king's laws, and you shouldn't put up with them. Now, if Ahasuerus has any sense at all, the first thing he ought to ask is, I say, well, hmm, if these folks are so bad, why haven't I heard of them before? Right? And by the way, they're not mentioned here by name, are they? He says, there's a certain people. I can't tell you who they are, but trust me, they're bad. Right? When someone, does that, when someone tries to sell you something, they can't give you any of the details, like numbers, but they can you know, assure you that everything is good, you might want to step back and reconsider. Right? What Haman is doing is he's manipulating Ahasuerus. If you remember Ahasuerus' name, what's his name? I will be silent and poor. Well, what Ahasuerus is allowing himself to do here, you'll see this, is he's allowing himself to be manipulated, and he's failing to exercise the oversight that a king should do. Keep reading with me. Verse 9, if it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasuries. So Haman says, let me sweeten the deal for you, king. King, if you just agree to this, I'll give you 10,000 talents of silver. Now, I want to talk about this number just for a minute. Get Second Chronicles 25. Second Chronicles 25. Second Chronicles 25, verse 6. Second Chronicles 25, 6. He hired also an hundred 
thousand mighty men out of valor for a hundred talents of silver. So let's make sure we're thinking about what that says there. In this verse, someone wanted to hire an army and he wanted to pay them. And what he did is for a hundred talents of silver, he was able to hire how many men? A hundred thousand. So if you do the math then, a hundred talents of silver can purchase a hundred thousand man army. Haman offered 10,000 talents of silver, which is enough to purchase a 10 million man army. He's offering a pretty significant sum here. By the way, you know how many, you know what the size of the U.S. military is this, this today? 1.5 million active, 800 reserves. Think of what's going on. Haman offers a sum that is sufficient to purchase a fighting force four times as large as the U.S. Army. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. Massive, massive amount of wealth. Could you do that? Can you put that on your credit card? Just call him a call visa and say, look, I need my limit extended. Right? Haman, when, when Haman's name means magnificent, the wealth this guy has is astronomical. Okay? By the way, um, now this is on Wikipedia, so you can believe this or not believe this. Darius, who is Ahasuerus' son, had a yearly tribute of twelve to 15,000 talents of silver. In other words, the taxes he collected on a yearly basis were twelve to 15,000 talents. Haman, in one instance, offers him 10,000 talents of silver. Does this guy have some resources, you think? What he's doing here is he's purchasing the genocide of Israel. King, don't ask questions. I've told you these are bad guys, and by you know, I'll take care of it. And by the way, King, since it's it, since you're giving me the opportunity to do you a service, I'll pay you the gross national product to do it. That's what's going on there. Verse ten. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. Well, isn't that the truth? What's he doing there? He takes his ring and says, here, you can transact business in my name, right? You don't need to consult me. Sign whatever you want. Prepare whatever law you want. Seal it. We'll make it happen. I don't know that I will be silent and poor is the perfect meaning of the name Ahasuerus. But you realize what he's doing there? He's abdicating responsibility as king, and he's giving the, the control of the kingdom and the ability to enforce laws and, frankly, the ability to, to exterminate a people to Haman. Here's my ring. Make it so. Things are, are looking bleak for Israel at this moment, aren't they? The Persian Empire is falling apart. Ahasuerus' father wants to build a temple for Israel, and Ahasuerus now is willing to give over the kingdom into the hands of the Agagite, the Jews' enemy. Verse 11, And the king said unto Haman, The silver is given to thee, the people also, to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. The king says, I don't even need the money, but you can just have the people, whatever you want to do with their lives, you can do. Verse 12, Then were the king's scribes called on the thirteenth day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants, and to the governors that were over every province, and to the rulers of every people of every province according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, in the name of King Ahasuerus was it written and sealed with the king's ring. And the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish. I love the legal language there. You know, in case you didn't get it, guys, not only should you destroy the Jews, you should then kill them, and if you have any questions, cause them to perish. Right? So in other words, let's write this in a way to make sure you get the message. To destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. So notice a couple things. What Haman is doing here, it's the reverse of what Saul was supposed to do, right? What Saul was supposed to do is he was to destroy all the Amalekites, right? Leave none of them surviving. He failed to do that. What Haman does here is say, look, you can kill all of them. What he's doing is 
He's not actually executing it himself. What he's doing is he's writing these letters, sending them out to the provinces and saying, guys, we have this great opportunity for you. Get prepared for 1213, for December 13th or whatever the equivalent would be. And what happens is on that day, you can kill as many Jews as you want. And you can keep their stuff. You know what it says? Take a spoil of them for the prey. So what he does is he gives them the legal right to commit murder. And he gives them the financial incentive to do so. By the way, if you do this, you can keep their stuff. Verse 14. The copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people that they should be ready against that day. Hey, guys, get ready. Sharpen your knives is what he's saying there. I don't want to make light of it. It, it, it's, it's It's the disgusting attempted destruction of God's people. Verse 15, the post went out being hastened by the king's commandment and the decree was given in Shushan the palace and the king and Haman sat down to drink but the city Shushan was perplexed. You see what's going on there? The city Shushan has just, the king's palace, they've just received word they're going to exterminate an entire group of people and the city's perplexed. Like This, this is horrible, what's going on? And what does the king do? The king and Haman say, let's go get a drink. Right? Look at me at Proverbs 31. Look at Proverbs 31, verse 4. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine. Nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Wasn't that exactly what's happened? So Ahasuerus has given over the ring to Haman. Go ahead, exterminate the people. I don't. What do I care? And then they sit down and have a drink. And it's it's the complete perversion of judgment. Chapter four, Esther four, verse one. When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry and came even before the king's gate. For none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Then called Esther for Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. You see what's happening there? She first sends sackcloth, or she first sends clothing to Mordecai and says, You don't have to be in sackcloth. And he refuses. And then she's like, what's going on? There's something I'm not aware of. And that's what's happening in verse 5. Verse 6. So Hatak went forth to Mordecai unto the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him and of the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Haman's trying to purchase the extinction of Israel. Verse 8. Also he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther and to declare it unto her and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make request before him for her people. And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Again Esther spake unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and all the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king in the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of his to put them to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these thirty days. So let's understand what that's telling us. Can you just show up and visit the king? You can't. What happens if, if you arrive unannounced, unless the king you know, points his scepter toward you, you're killed. Now what's happened with Esther? She hasn't been summoned before the king for 30 days. The reason I tell you that, would Esther have reason to feel, hey, maybe the king's unhappy with me? 
He hasn't called for me in 30 days. Maybe I'm on the outs. Verse 12. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words. Mordecai's response here is, is an example of the beauty of the language of the King James Bible. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. See what Mordecai says? Esther, don't think that you're going to escape this. Verse 14. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? A couple interesting things there. God is not dependent upon any one man to accomplish his purposes. So if Esther hadn't done this, would God have accomplished the deliverance of the Jews? He would have. The other thing about it is, what it tells you is, as a believer, you often have the opportunity to be used of God. And what you need to do is you need to take it. And that, that's what Mordecai here is instructing Esther to do. Then Esther, this is verse 15, Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer, Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish... I perish. Now, notice something about that. You know when people pray today and they, they command God to do things, and they then pronounce, well, God did this and God did that, and they, they talk with great presumption about things that they imagine God has done or things they think that he has to do. What Esther says here is, I'm going to go do this. Do I know what the outcome will be? No, I mean, if I perish, I perish. It might turn out to not be to my liking, but I'm nonetheless going to, to act in faith. Now, notice something verse 16 doesn't say. Does verse 16 have the word prayer? It doesn't, does it? Well, do you think they were praying? Do you think that what uh, Esther said is, look, just don't eat for three days, and then I'll go in under the king, because you not eating will accomplish nothing. Like, well, what would it, they're praying, right? Plainly they're praying, but it doesn't mention they're praying, I think, because the book of Esther doesn't mention God. So it doesn't mention the fact that they are praying. My point is, what I just want you to get is, there are things that are obviously going on in Esther. She wanted them to pray that this would go well. That are not mentioned, but that are nonetheless going on. Verse 17. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Esther now issues a command to Mordecai. Chapter 5. Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house. Now this is, this is extra credit, but notice this with me. Look at... Chapter 4, verse 16. Go gather together all the Jews that are in Shushan and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. Remember how in Matthew it talks about three days and three nights? Now look at Esther 5, verse 1. Now it came to pass on the third day. What those two verses just told you is you can have three days or nights and do something on the third day. There's a great debate within fundamentalism as to when the crucifixion occurs. Some say it's Wednesday, some say it's Thursday, some day it's Friday. Well, it's plainly not Friday because there can't be three days or nights in between Friday and the first day of the week, Sunday. What some say is they say it has to be Wednesday in order to get three full days and nights in between Wednesday and Sunday morning. But what that just told you, 4.16 and 5.1, you put, when you put them together, you can have three days and three nights and do something on the third day. 
So what I would tell you is that just told you that the Thursday crucifixion is the right way to view when Christ is crucified. It's not Friday, and it's not Wednesday. It's Thursday. See, uh, you've, you've heard this before. God has a wrench that will fix any nut. And what happens is he has in his book, the, the answers are all there. The problem is we're too lazy to find them. But the answers are there. And I would tell you that gives you clarity about the, the, the Thursday crucifixion. So evaluate that for yourself. Go back to chapter 5, verse 2. And it was so when the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then said the king unto her, what wilt thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be even given thee to the half of the kingdom. Now, is there any other time where you recall something like that happening? It happens with John the Baptist, doesn't it? So get with me Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. Look at verse 21. Actually, start in verse... Well, start in verse 17. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. So Herod puts John the Baptist in prison for the sake of his wife. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Herod, so Herodias doesn't like that so much. Verse 19, Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and unholy, and observed him, and when he had heard him, and did many things, and heard him gladly. So what happens is Herodias wants to kill John the Baptist, but Herod says, well, John the Baptist is a good guy, and I, I'm not going to kill him just because, you know, he's told me I've done something unlawful, which, by the way, John was right. Verse 21, And when a convenient day was come, that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And he swear unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. And this is an example of kings saying foolish things that they had not to say. What if she says, Yes, give me half the kingdom? I mean, what's he going to do then? Give her half the kingdom? And what happens is this is just... You know, what is happening? Yeah, I better not. Verse 24. And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And of course what happens is John the Baptist is killed as a result of this because Herod feels he can't go back on, on what he said. Well, this is the exact same thing that is going on in Esther chapter 5 where Ahasuerus says to Esther, I'll give thee anything they want. Now the good news here is Esther has a lot more sense than Herodias, or Herodias' daughter does. So go back with me to Esther chapter 5, verse 4. And Esther answered, If it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. Now you see the parallel again? What happens in Esther 1 is Ahasuerus wants Vashti to come to a feast, and she refuses to do it. Esther risks her life, goes before the king, and says, King, what I want is I want you to come to a feast with me, a feast that I prepared for. You see the parallelism? And she's, she's the, the anti-Vashti, if you will. She does the exact opposite of what she would do. Verse 5, Then the king said,